Good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank today's attendees for registering for the 13th Learning Views webinar series sponsored by Training Pros and Harrisburg University. My name is Pam Porter. I am a relationship manager here in Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas with Training Pros. We hope that today attendees walk away from our session better informed on learning strategies that are easy to create and implement. You will be able to start implementing these strategies and or pursue additional education certifications in the L&D field that will allow you to develop these types of solutions for your clients or your organization. Training Pros and Harrisburg University are partnering on the Learning Views webinar series because we'd like to share the latest developments that Training Pros is observing with our clients and to demonstrate how Harrisburg University is able to provide a master's level program to professionals who want to pursue an advanced degree in the learning technology space. Training Pros is a leading provider of contract learning and development talent in the U.S. We provide organizations the talent they need to design, develop, and deliver learning solutions to their organization when they do not have the internal capacity or expertise. We provide instructional designers, technical communicators, e-learning, m-learning developers, trainers, facilitators, and organizational development. Our clients work with local relationship managers just like myself who invest in learning our clients' business. We can consult on the right staffing solution for their project and their organization and then provide the right talent the first time. Harrisburg University translates the latest developments and learning technologies into a master's program for professionals responsible for building skills and capabilities in their corporate organization. Harrisburg University provides students with leading edge approaches and skills to help them apply existing and emerging learning technologies in a variety of learning environments. Today, learning and development must constantly redefine themselves in terms of value to the organization and how they provide learning and professional development solutions. Lengthy classroom courses are losing ground as stakeholders' first choice. Decision makers want to see learning take place without taking employees out of their productive routine. Learning needs to take place in a smaller chunk, preferably while employees are at work. The key word here is easy, easy for the learner, easy for the developer. How is learning and development going to deliver an easy sol solution? In this webinar today, we're going to explore ways to replace time-intensive productivity lowering learning with solutions that are at learners' fingertips, just in time yet comprehensive, engaging, and easy to create and implement. You will see how to design a blended learning solution that retains instructional integrity even though the pieces are scattered among different learning portals. As we explore real-world scenarios from industry leaders, you will embark on a journey of seeing just how learning and development can deliver easy learning that works. Today's presenter is Teresa Davenport. She is president of Davenport Design and Development, a training and development firm that powers D3 University. So without further ado, I turn it over to Teresa. Thank you so much, Teresa. Thank you, Pam, and welcome, everyone. Glad to be with you today. And as she said, um, I started Davenport Design and Development. Actually, she didn't say this, but 20 years ago this year, and it's been an exciting experience, exciting journey, and to me it just keeps getting more exciting. So um, I, I'm looking forward to sharing some of the excitement with you today. Uh, if you haven't taken a look at my website, I encourage you to um, check out DavenportDesign.com, and you'll see a link here. And also, oh, make sure you link in, uh, connect with me on LinkedIn, and um, also with D3, D3 University. Uh, if you'd like to take any of those courses, I have a coupon code on the screen there that gives you a 50% discount. And all of uh, the previous webinars that I've done for Training Pros are also on my website, as well as some associated blogs and some additional blogs, and uh, just a lot of resources to help you be a fantastic uh, learning and development professional. So without further ado, let's just jump right in. Let's see if you recognize that picture right there. If you build it, they will come for years now, 
uh, as learning professionals, we, we built a learning solution and people came. People came to the class. They took the e-learning course and um, things are changing. Now, learners are here. They are already here. They're in our midst and they are learning whether we're helping them or not. They're learning. So today we're going to talk about how, how do we um, stay abreast of new learning technologies, how do we stay ahead of the curve, and uh, how do we um, stay relevant as learning uh, is changing so quickly. So for today's topics, we'll begin talking by, about the Learning and Development Challenge. What is it? And are you ready? Uh, charting a new course, a new learning architecture. Do you, are you familiar with the new learning architectures and do you know how to use them, how to develop for them? Building the, tree, building the dream. We'll look at those tools and the tool sets that you need um, moving into the future. And also we'll look a little bit about how you know when you've arrived. In other words, how do you evaluate learning with these new learning technologies? Now, I always like to incorporate a little bit of history, kind of setting the scene. Don't yawn. Don't tune out on me on history. If you don't like history, just hang in there. This is really a history of looking at um, more of technology in learning right here. If you look at the 20th century alone, in the 1920s, we had the first testing machine. I didn't investigate to see what it was testing, but I have a feeling it was probably some sort of cognitive assessment tool. Um, and then I didn't mention it here, but in the 40s, we did have some uh, a lot of training going on with massive uh, amounts of World War II, people needing to be skilled to enter um, the, the, um, the military and uh, get going very quickly. So we had some training going on there. Uh, Skinner came along with some behaviorist um, methodologies. The stimulus response came along in there. And then in the 50s, we had our first teaching machine. Uh, again, I didn't investigate to see what that was. I've, I found this little... Uh, timeline here, and it just it really fit our needs. So I jumped in right here in the 1960s. This was something that I absolutely knew. CBT, if any of you ever have seen that acronym, uh, maybe you've used it in practice. CBT first was developed in the 60s. Um, I know that in the 80s and even into the 90s, I was still seeing CBT being referred to as computer-based training. In the 70s, we got our first computer with a mouse and GUI. Uh, does anyone remember what GUI stood for? It was, I think, Guided User Interface. It's when we went from that amber screen, I mean the amber or the green text with the black background, to um, the, the screens that we see today with the real life pictures on the screen um, and a mouse to move around the screen. So that was big. Now, I actually didn't get one of those. I didn't see them in the workplace, I don't think, until the late 80s, early 90s. In the 80s, we got our first personal computer. I believe the first one was a Mac. I know in 1987, I got a Tandy. By the way, again, with the chat, if anyone wants to enter their comments, their first experiences with these, I just love to see. Of course, maybe I'm the oldest one on here. That's fine, too. But what were your first experiences uh, with, with any of these things back in these years, these decades? Um, in the 90s? was the internet. Thank you, Al Gore. Um, we got the internet. And I, I can remember, my memory from that decade was early 90s, working with the government, sitting with this guy who was an analyst, and he, he wanted to show me uh, Mosaic. He said, this is really cool. It's not the black background. It was the GUI interface. And he was trying to explain that th we were looking at what we call now websites in other parts of the world. All I'd seen before that was Isaac and Plato. And, this was new and dynamic and, and different, and he, and he explained what a URL was. This was, I think, 93. And um, it, it, my, my husband happened to be sitting there, too. He, we were working together. He said, well, try typing in www.cocacola.com, because uh, we'd already figured out com was, was important. And he tried that, and it did not exist. We typed in a couple of other common business names, and none of them was out there. And, and we were thinking, OK, so how do we buy those? The 90s was an exciting time, anyway, for the evolution of the internet. And that's when really things really began to um, change for us in the technology picture and the learning picture. So in 2000, added on top of that was e-learning. And uh, with e-learning, the emergence of it, people began to um, move into platforms that were um, interactive 
on our computers. It was, again, very exciting. And then 2010 and onwards, which we'll talk about a lot today, we've introduced social learning, online learning, which is another uh, morph of e-learning, and informal learning. So we'll look at those a lot today. So that's just a big picture. And none of you have chatted. I was hoping I would see some good experiences there, but feel free to enter them later. Um, let's move on. And I believe uh, Justin has a frequency poll that we're going to do. And this is an opportunity for us to build our own timeline based on your vast experience. Um, I would just like to know, back in 2000, try to think, if you were alive in 2000, what were you doing? Were you in school? Were you in college? Were you in the workplace? And how were you learning? How were you learning? Let's build these. You got 2000. Once you've answered that one, move over to 2008. If you were developing learning, what type of learning were you developing in 2008? And then in 2016, and you know, we just started. You can think back to 2015. What were you doing? What were you building uh, in 2016? This is fascinating. And uh, Justin, I'm pretty sure you are broadcasting this for everyone to see. And by the way, this webinar is recorded, and I will do a follow-up blog. And I'll probably try to capture what you've got here, because this is a really nice picture from a learning and development perspective. Us as professionals, this is what we see. And I doubt that one has been built like this. Um, so if you, know, if you look back, 2000, by far, 91%, it was classroom. 2008, we see a split between classroom and e-learning. And then the combo right there, that's perfect. That's um, very, very representative of what was going on in 2008. I think pretty much anyone here would agree. And then 2016, it's interesting to look at 2016. We've, we're actually doing a lot more OJT. And, and I have to agree, I'm seeing it a lot. It's more sophisticated. There's a lot more coaching and mentoring going on. I think that, that probably goes back to managers being the new mentors, and they're needing a lot of skilling in that. Um, and then SharePoint, community of practice, very interesting. All right, I'll probably reflect, reflect back on this poll. Justin, if you can take that down now. We make sure we, do, we want to save that. That was a great info. Uh, and I'll probably reflect back on this as we go through our webinar today. So the questions that we face as we move into the future are, where do IDs fit into this learning landscape that's quickly becoming self-driven? And how do we stay relevant, or how do we provide content that's ready for the 21st century learner? Um, and did also, Will we be needed? How, how are we going to stay relevant in the future? If, and if we are going to be needed, what is it we're going to be di doing? How is it different from what we're doing now? These are the types of questions we want to address today. And here's the challenge that we have in front of us is we must leverage the most effective learning solutions available. And in order to do that, we have to make sure that content is readily accessible for the user. Now, we know you could be thinking, well, they, they really don't need us for that. They can find it. They can Google it. We'll discuss that shortly, and, and that is partially true. But uh, in the workplace, ideally, we want to make sure it is where the learner needs it. A big uh, skill that we need to have is the ability to create big design, to learn to manage multiple learning sources and delivery types, not just I developed a job aid, or I created a webinar, or I, I'm developing a podcast. We're going to be pulling all of these things together for one comprehensive learning experience. And then, of course, staying abreast of current and emerging learning technologies and incorporating them into our learning design. So those are the types of things we're going to look at today, and how do we do that? How we'll do it is build and curate content that works with today's and tomorrow's technology. It's no longer enough to know um, what's the technology today. We really need to constantly study but what's coming. And, and if I build something, if I recommend something for a client today, um, can it be re retooled or will it work with tomorrow's technology? Because it's changing so quickly that we want to provide a, something of value um, into the future if possible. And we also have to be thinking about today's and tomorrow's target audience. 
uh, we're working with baby boomer, boomers, lots of them still in the, the workforce. And they learn very differently from our millennials. Uh, very diverse target audience. And really, we have heavy at both ends. We have a lot of millennials in, entering the workforce. And we have the baby boomer, boomers still there. And we have to learn how to accommodate both of their learning styles as well as the ones in between. Now, among all of this, we still have to remember those of you that um, have are rooted and grounded in instructional design, uh, you'll remember the ADDIE acronym, Analysis, Development, Design, excuse me, Design, Development, Implementation, and Evaluation. It's not dead. Uh, when I kept referring back to big design, I think that ADDIE is something that we as instructional designers will have to continue to think about. Um, but we're just going to be adding some additional um, factors into the mix. So what does ADDIE look like when we have so many options for delivery? I'm going to ask you, as we move into these next few screens, I'll go ahead and show you the next one. If you want to do a screen grab of this, remember the webinar is recorded. But if you want to grab these for yourself so that you can later do your own assessment, or even now, do your own assessment. This is not a poll that everyone sees. There's nothing to mark on the screen. But I think what, what we need to do as, as learning and development professionals is assess ourselves and say, am I ready? Am I ready for the, the current and the emerging learning technology? So let's begin with analysis. Um, in analysis, you need to be able to match a learning goal uh, to a learning strategy or a delivery medium. So you've got to be able to look at the goal of a course or, or even uh, even as small as an objective of, of a topic, and say, what's the best way for the learner to learn this? So in your analysis phase, you need to be thinking about multiple delivery strategies simultaneously. So you, you in your mind, can begin to think, well, for, for this type of learning, for what's to be learned here, and what the client has available, and what technologies they're, they're investing in for the future, this is the best way for them, uh, for, this is the best delivery technology or, or strategy to use right now. This is the way we have to begin to think. In design, that thought continues. And we have to learn to create blueprints that will accommodate a number of different delivery, delivery strategies. And I actually, I think I see someone, some of you on the call here who have worked with me on some of these where instead of in the past, we knew when we went into design that we were developing a classroom course, or we, would, we were developing an e-learning course. But now, with, with big design and multiple delivery options, we have to think differently. Um, so do you know how to build a design document that, for, for each subcomponent of the learning, you might be prescribing one or more delivery options, such as, a, a part of it might be e-learning when they're learning their, their um, terms and their concepts. Uh, there might be a community of practice, a wiki. And then they go into the classroom, and, and it's sort of the flipped classroom model where they might practice those things they learned in their, in their self-paced um, asynchronous environment to come to the classroom and practice. And then they have some OJT where they've got performance guides, and you are putting all of this together. You're putting together a big picture with multiple delivery streams. That's what you've got to be able to do with your design phase. In development, this is a lot of different types of media um, that you might be developing for. And um, I, would, I would love to, even in the chat, if you just wanted to put the ones that you have actually developed for, I'd like to see. Or even, uh, how about this? What about any that you haven't developed for? Are there any here that, that you have not developed for? Uh, I'd like to see people's, um, where their holes are. The first one, by the way, is curation. And curation is becoming a new word, but all of us who have, who have developed uh, learning solutions have researched. We've looked at the source content, and we've tried to come up with um, what uh, what material is most re relevant. And that's sort of what curation is. But it's becoming, in many cases, an end unto itself. We 
look at the research material, we choose the best of it, and we put it in front of the learner. And in a nutshell, that's what curation is, and it's becoming a bigger and bigger part of our job. Um, the rest of those should be pretty familiar to you. MOOCs are your massive open online learning um, that many, many people could be taking. Um, the last one, I just had to put it on there. I was doing a little research, and I noticed that um, there have been and continue to be experiments um, about playing with chip technology that's actually implanted. And I can just see us in the future. It doesn't, it doesn't make me, um, it's, it's a little scary, but designing uh, content that actually goes onto a chip that goes into a brain. So like if you're a customer service associate and you, you finish your onboarding and, and you get your chip instead of a knowledge base, it's, it's a scary thought. But um, I, I was found some, some interesting topics about that as I was researching this. But you need to assess yourself and say, OK, have I done all these? Do I know how to do all these? Where are my weaknesses? In implementation, um, if you have worked on the implementation end of learning, then you likely might have managed a classroom, scheduling, managing the logistics, the people, the trainers, um, all of those things. And I didn't even put that on here, but uh, you need to assess yourself there, of course, because classroom learning uh, still has a place. But more and more, especially those of you that are developing e-learning, um, need to be thinking about how much you know about learning management systems. If you have developed e-learning, most likely you've been at the end of your e-learning, or maybe at the beginning, where you were looking at your specifications. And you had to know how this e-learning would be uploaded um, when it was complete for a learner to see, what kind of LMS was being used, and what are the publication guidelines. So you need to know those types of things. LMS, uh, LMSs are expanding in their functionality in, and in their capability. So we also need to know what are those functioning uh, functionalities that are that are emerging, so that we, as we're developing our training, know how to develop it to work with what the LMS can do. Um, so those are the kinds of things we need to know about as we are working on the implementation side of the ADDI model. In evaluation, um, in the past, traditionally, if we were the, the good old classroom course with uh, level one through four, you know, smile sheets, assessments, um, tests, um, then OJT, and some benchmarking to see the impact on the organization. Those were the types of things we'd done in the past. And uh, as we explore LMS, um, LMSs in a few minutes, we'll see that they're, they're just a wide variety of other things, other ways of learning that we need to be able to track if, if the, the stakeholders want to know the impact of the learning experience. Then we've got to be able to track it. So this opens up really a whole new world in the area of evaluation. But we have to remember, this is easy, right? This is easy. So if you think about it, really everything we've talked about so far, one thing is changing. And that is learning options are expanding rapidly. And the degree of assistance that a learner needs varies widely. So our role is going to vary depending on uh, what type of preparation is needed for learning to take place. So I'm going to spend a few minutes walking through types of um, these delivery strategies, breaking them into categories, so that we can see the level of difficulty uh, and expertise that's required for us to do them. First of all, formal learning options. If you think back about the timeline we looked at earlier, and even the one that we constructed, up until mid-2000s, late-2000s, Formal learning was mostly what everyone did, uh, instructor-led, classroom training, went to seminars, maybe a virtual classroom, but those were still very young. Um, and this is not necessarily put in a, to a, into a timeline here. This is just a category, say, formal learning. Um, simulations and games, e-learning, all of these are considered formal learning. Um, and in fact, I believe all of these are also synchronous. They happen together. I skipped the assessments, but um, that is another one. And then uh, embedded at work, um, project management, which really I think is what they meant by this first bullet here, 
reference materials, EPSS, uh, things that you're doing as a part of your job or that you access as a part of your job. It really doesn't ex uh, interrupt your work stream. And then on demand and social, which again, and thinking back on our timeline, that was sort of the 2010 and forward. And uh, these are these emerging learning technologies that uh, we're trying to look at more closely today to make sure that we are equipped to uh, recommend them and use them in the workplace. I wanted to look at each one of those, take them apart, and look at them from a, from a difficulty perspective and a length of time. When we look at formal learning, which is what we've been doing for the longest, um, Formal learning, from an instructional design standpoint, it does require most, if you look at this list, they do require instructional design expertise. We need to understand methodologies and strategies, and we certainly need to understand the ADDIE process as well as some other um, design processes and taxonomies and so on. That's important for this type of learning. So I put in general that this is a, a difficulty level of three. You see the scale at the bottom. It's high, it's high difficulty, and when you think about sims, if you've ever developed simulations, games, e-learning, especially those, um, they, they have a long development cycle with a lot of testing and so on. So the difficulty and the development cycle, I'm giving a three for formal learning. Things that are embedded at work, uh, to, for them to be done well, for a learner to learn effectively from them, they do require some expertise, I, I do believe. Um, the, the first one, the project management, really is, I wouldn't consider a part of instructional design necessarily, but preparing reference materials like a procedure manual, uh, the online procedure manual, the electronic performance support, um, customer and peer feedback, rotational assignments, each one of these. Um, I have created and I've seen them done without having instructional design expertise and we add a lot of value um, when, when we are involved in these and it does require some work for us to tie each one of these back to a, a learning goal or a performance objective. So I gave these a level two. And then the last ones, on demand and social. Some of these require no input at all from us, like uh, Google search. Anyone can do a Google search. Um, using expert directories, uh, again, can be done pretty much without us. But I will go back and say, this is interesting, and this is where we, re we really need to be thinking about our role and how it affects other, um, uh, other emerging technologies. I, I just a week or so ago was asked by um, a, a, a well, you, you would know who, I, who it was if I said, but they, they're doing analytics and they are trying to hire instructional designers to help them with their smart searches. So it's interesting that instructional design is becoming embedded in everything from, from analytics and smart searches to marketing, online marketing, um, web uh, construction, the, in, the information that's on, of, on the internet, people are trying to make it smarter, and they need us to make it smarter. So while we could give that a zero, really, I'm saying we've got a one or a two there because it doesn't require a lot of time or effort or expertise on our part. And then uh, same thing with books and articles. That's where curation comes in. We're just researching to make sure we put the best um, resources in front of the learner. Podcasts and videos, those actually, the video especially, could go on up to a three. If you've ever developed a video, it can be quite consuming if you're doing it for a baby boomer. boomer. If you're doing it for a millennial, millennials just want you to go out there and use your smartphone and you know do a rough cut, and, and they're happy with that. But um, some videos are quite time consuming. Uh, and then the rest of those, you can see, those are more of your social learning and Right now, while I have actually been involved in the, from a design standpoint in developing those, they did not require a high level of expertise, nor did they require a lot of time to create. So the takeaway here is that our old, I call them old, they're not all old, but our formal learning strategies are the ones that require uh, the most expertise and they have the longest development cycle. Those that are embedded at work, 
uh, are moderate difficulty. And those that are new, these on-demand, social, um, informal learning, require the least effort from us and the least skills. And, and by the way, if you're someone who manages a team of instructional designers, this is a good way to think about how to use the people that are working on your team, is put the more experienced ones on the formal learning um, efforts and the less experienced on some of these that don't require as much expertise or time to develop. Now, I wanted to take a little tour from the user's perspective, from the, lear from the learner's perspective. And um, some of you may have already seen those. Let's see, Justin, I think this is where we were going to begin bumping out the screen. And uh, I guess I'm seeing the right Q&A and chat, but I'm not seeing anything on those screens. So if, if you're not asking questions, that's fine. But please feel free to use those to share any comments or questions that you have. So Justin, can you can we bump out this? Maybe I can do it. There we go. So we've got our big screen here. Um, if you're not seeing it, by the way, you can control your own screen. If you're having trouble seeing the screen, you, you can bump it out and make it larger. Um, And I just did, and I actually, OK, here we go. I'm trying to get mine set up the way I want it so I can talk about this. OK, so for our da a sample learning dashboard, um, if you've ever taken a college course or a course through your employer, any course, you have usually a dashboard. From an instructional designer standpoint, this is um, what you might be creating pieces for this. You might have created a blog, or a discussion forum, or an e-learning course. But from a user's perspective, this is what they see. And they would see the online courses that were created, uh, how to access if they want help from IT, or they want some tutorials. So these are all the things that they would see that we might have created. And then this one is a sample community of practice. And a community of practice, I've talked about these before, but this is just a compilation of resources that could be in any form. In this case, we've got online training up here. And by the way, this particular one is Workforce 3, the number 3, and spelled out 1, dot org. Uh, this is the one that, and again, this is something an instructional designer might be called on to do, is put together one of these. This was one that I helped put together for Department of Labor. Um, and we put together online training. We had just announcements, and we had webinars, connecting to sub-communities, finding solutions. This was a search tool, another search tool. Uh, you could upload your own content. You had online help. And then their top resources were listed down here at the bottom right. So this is just, again, another way to organize multiple types of learning um, delivery methods. This is an online academy, like your corporate university. Um, this one is for ONET Online. And again, this is another Department of Labor product that I had worked to put together. And this is one that I also helped maintain. I don't know if I mentioned that specifically when we were talking through the different types of um, learning. But this is something you might be called upon to do in the curation area. That's exactly what I did here, was I reviewed articles, and I uploaded them here. Um, I created not just me, but many people, numbers of people created webinars, created courses, um, interviewed people to gather spotlights for people who were um, workforce development professionals. We created podcasts. So these are all different types of things that any one of you might have already been creating. But again, this is how it looks from a user's or a learner's perspective. This is what they see when it's all put together in one place. This is, to me, quite fascinating. It's a sample learning plan. And uh, I'm going to bump out on my own screen for just a minute so you can see that there is a, yes, you can download this resource. Um, I, Justin, I think that everyone can see the downloadable resource at the right. Uh, if not, can you put that somewhere where they can see the link to this? Um, it's a 
very sophisticated and yet simple way to think about um, a learning plan that incorporates multiple delivery strategies. So I'm going to blow my screen back up again. This is one that you'll certainly, if you have the option to enlarge your screen, you will want to. Uh, you could try capturing this image and try to blow it up on your own screen if you're not seeing it. Uh, remember, you can also see the recording again later. I'm going to talk through it, though, and just explain to you what we're seeing here. If, for example, if you need a context, this was just a sample, but it works really for, for just about any kind of learning solution. Let's just pretend that our learning solution for today is we want to be an expert uh, storyline e-learning developer in three months. And I noticed that this one was put together with a three-month time span. And the, this little, you can barely see it. Uh, if you cannot read it, this is, says M1W1, meaning month one, week one. And if you go all the way around the circle, at the bottom, it's M3 week 4. So it's a three-month time span in this wheel. And the outer band that is medium blue is the formal learning strategies that we talked about earlier. The navy is collaborative learning strategies. And in the inside, the green area is informal learning strategies. So let's start to take this apart a little bit. You started on your um, storyline training, and you decided the first thing you were going to do is take an instructor-led course. Now, this is the part you probably can't see at all, but I'll tell you. These little icons on the top left, each one is color-coded to match what you see on the wheel. So this blue color here matches instructor-led training. So you took a course, and it lasted this long. The width of this is the duration. The height, like you see one right here that's really tall, that's the intensity, how focused it was. So you did, some, you did a couple of classes. Notice how the classes decrease in frequency and length as you go around the circle. You didn't need much instructor-led training later. You also enrolled in some lynda.com storyline courses over here. Uh, in week one, you took some online, some e-learning courses. Notice the green says e-learning right over, right over here in this box. Um, something else you did was you were constantly accessing a wiki. But as you went through your weeks at about the end of your first month, you didn't need that wiki so much anymore because the wiki was explaining your basic terms and concepts. That's what a wiki does. It just gives you information. You didn't need it as much the further you went. Um, this gray uh, shaded is synchronous chat. So you were constantly IMing your coworkers to try to get uh, guidance as you were working. And notice it was quite intense through the first month, and then you didn't need as much. I won't go through all of these, but I, I hope you're getting the idea that this is just an ex example of how multiple learning strategies can come together to form one cohesive learning plan. Uh, one thing I will point out, there were a couple of these down toward the center of the wheel where you got to the collaborative and to the informal learning, where you were getting on blogs. I know Storyline has a great blog with lots of expert users and those users put articles, they put sample interactions, sample templates. So you, you, were used, you were accessing those things. This was called user-generated content. I noticed this was tall right about month two. And um, like I said, this was just sample. It wasn't put together for storyline, but when I thought through that analogy, it really seemed to fit. Um, I don't know how to recreate such a thing. I wish I did, because I would love to continue to use it. I don't know that Excel can project something this sophisticated, but uh, it's a really nice model. I know for myself, if I were going to try to create this on, well, not on paper, but on my computer, I would probably be using Excel. And each one of these would be, each delivery strategy was, would probably be um, in a column that says delivery strategy. But anyway, I just wanted you to see that as a sample learning plan. And I'm going to back out of our big screen here. And uh, one chat, one Q&A. Whoa, OK. All right, so no questions about that. We'll move on. I wanted to show you a few samples. Um, actually, these are examples in practice. These are actual 
projects that I've worked on, most of them within the last year or two. And I was having to put together multiple delivery strategies for one learning goal. This first one was for a financial services company, and it was a global onboarding. And I was just developing the materials for the mentors. So the scenario is you have new salespeople coming, being hired. Their managers are learning to be mentors, and they are learning how to use mentoring tools with their new mentees, with the new people that have been hired. So uh, what we created for this was a mentor orientation as a webinar. So that was the delivery method. Um, and it was just an introduction to the leader's role and responsibility. And then we had a navigating the learning portal. So we showed that learner dashboard, dashboard a few minutes ago. This was showing them how to use their portal. We distributed it via e-learning and as an online job aid. Then we had a checklist for leaders. And this was a macro checklist. It basically showed them the whole onboarding sequence and where they would be involved and what specific steps they needed to do um, while that person is being onboarded. And we created this in the form of a performance guide. Then we had a series, a large series of activity guides that every time the mentor was going to interact with the new hire, they knew exactly what to do, what questions to ask, what kind of behaviors to look for, um, how to evaluate the new hire, and so on. So we had those types of things. And those were also created as performance guides. Finally, we had one comprehensive uh, guide. And it really just put all the resources in one place. So it was job aids, best practices, uh, more detailed checklists. And we had those in a number of different um, locations and a number of different formats for the mentors. Another example, uh, competency-based certification. This is going on all the time in the workplace after you get them onboarded. It's very common for you or for an employee to then become certified in their role. For example, if you are working in a call center and you're going to be a customer service associate, you, you get onboarded, but before you can actually start interacting with, with customers, you have to learn the company way. You have to learn the knowledge that you need to interact with customers. So in this scenario, um, we've developed 12 e-learning courses for these people to become certified. That's where they just get their basic terminology and concepts, corporate intranet. And before they enter the classroom, they, they take these courses and then spread throughout the e-learning experience. There are classroom courses. And in the classroom, it's more of a flipped classroom model, where they come to the classroom after they've had some basic terms and concepts, uh, been able to nail those down. So when they come to the classroom, they're ready to interact. They're ready to practice. They don't sit passively and listen. They start applying and practicing what they've learned. So that's classroom facilitated. And then they have OJT checklists. They quickly go from that classroom to their desk and they practice the step-by-step -step processes that they've been learning through their e-learning in the classroom with online performance guides. And they also always have access to a community of practice, those online resources, um, articles, webcasts, podcasts, um, any type of information that is helpful to them in learning their job. And those are distributed in one community of practice that is a uh, link on their intranet. The wiki works in a similar similar way, but it's more, at, if you're picturing Bloom's taxonomy, it's more at the bottom of the taxonomy. It's just those basic terms and concepts that correlate somewhat with those e-learning courses that they had taken earlier. It's just a way to refresh their memory on the basic foundations of what they need to know. And that, again, is found on their intranet. So all of these, from an instructional designer perspective, is we're having to keep up with all of these, make sure that they are there for the learner, that they are complete. And one thing to consider is that the content is created once, but it may be the very same content that is being fed through each one of these channels. And I think that's a very important concept to get when we talk about learning being easy. The last one I wanted to show you was an organizational rebranding, because this one is a little bit more, I guess, soft skills. But it's still something that we as instructional designers 
do get tasked with from time to time. So this is where the situation is the company is getting a new culture, uh, perhaps, or a, a new uh, identity. They might have been acquired by another business. So their colors are changing, their branding is changing, their their logo, their everything is changing about who they are, and they have to learn their new identity. So the first thing that happens is we work with the CEO to generate a video, and it's just an announcement making the overall statement about the rebranding, and it is distributed as an e-blast, so everyone gets it as an email, and it's on their homepage, just you know, like a YouTube inserted where you can see the the face. You click on it, and the video begins to play. A high-level webinar. Um, this one gets a little little more detail. It's the key points of the rebranding. What does this mean for me? You start getting into the with them, and distributed the same way as the initial announcement was made. And then we've got these living it out vignettes. This gets even more into the. Um, what does this really look like for me? Using every type of employee, these are distributed periodically, and it's just a person talking about their experience with the rebranding, um, how they've incorporated it into their work lives, uh, how it's impacted them, how it's made things better, and so on. And for this, you could use, if you have a um, corporate uh, LinkedIn type of network or a Facebook social network, that would be a good way to distribute these. Uh, as well as an e-blast, and of course I didn't put intranet, but it could also be a link on your corporate um, homepage. And rebranding guidelines and job aids. Like I said, if your branding is changing, we as instructional designers need to, we need a new template. We need to know what those new colors are, um, you know, the banners and the footers and all those types of things. We need, to, we need that information so we can incorporate it into our training materials. Um, those logos and taglines, your new tagline and messages, your marketing messages. Um, different people who will be touching those types of things need access to that, and that is distributed through the intranet. We as instructional designers may have actually put together how to use these things. And then um, the weekly webinar is uh, just a focus for, it's, it's employee specific, for depending on the type of employee that you are and how you need to use the rebranding. It's more of a lunch and learn, e-blast invite, it's synchronous and um, using things like PowerPoint and Adobe Connect. So um, those are some examples. What I wanted to do now was give you an example to build one up for yourself. And Justin, if you can pop up our first um, example. This is a SharePoint deployment that we're going to build. And I, I realize you may want to use every possible resource that you can, but just for today, just to give you a feel for this, you're in charge. Your company is about to launch SharePoint, and you um, it's a centralized depository for all of your corporate knowledge. Your, your files, your directories, go-to resources, they're no longer on your little network drive. And you ha everyone has to learn how to navigate SharePoint, how to upload, download, uh, check out files, check them back in, manage their workspaces. So you choose. Uh, what, do you, what two formal resources would you um, recommend for this type of learning? After you finish the formal box, move down to informal. And after you finish informal, um, let's see, we don't have our collaborative. I don't, yeah, OK, the last one. Um, this was, I believe, what we call our collaborative solutions in the bottom right box. But choose two of those as well. And then once everyone's had a chance that wants to respond, I believe we have one other box that gives you an opportunity to say why you made the choices you did. So if you'd mention um, what you chose and why you chose it, that would be great. It's interesting, too, to just while you're doing this, I'll comment that on formal, you chose e-learning simulations. That's awesome for, for SharePoint, because you need to see point click, you know, mouse point to mouse point. What am I supposed to do, and how do I do it? And in the virtual classroom, that's excellent. Um, and then on the informal message forums and discussion boards, that's good. Expert networks, going to your community of practice is really good, because you could get articles there about how people are using SharePoint within your workplace, uh, how to do it smart. Um, that's a great resource. On your last one, collaborative, the wiki. For your basic terms and technology, your basic terms and concepts is good. And then we 
Oh, I see we've got two message forums there, but you chose message forums again. So that's excellent. All right. Uh, so Justin, if we could move on to the next one. No, next, because I believe we had another scenario. Uh, yeah, we do have we did have the short answer. I wasn't sure if you wanted to move to that one. I could bring okay, that. Where, out just... Yeah, if you want to pop that up there, just give everyone a chance to say why they chose what they chose. Yeah, right here. I would love to hear. Uh, yeah, I see what happened. Those two, the last the last question and this one got reversed. But um, why did you choose what you chose? And um, if, if you would just share someone who, why you chose what you chose. In that formal, we had formal and informal. And the last one that wasn't categorized correctly, I think it was supposed to be collaborative. Mm -mm. And if no one responds, I see we're running a little short on time. OK, very good. Virtual, yeah, hit uh -huh, large audience of employees in a short time. That's good. And those could be recorded, too, and listened to again. That's good. Anyone else? Consistent message, that's right. That's very good. And again, those of you that were choosing the simulations, it, you know, it shows you exactly what to do, how to do it. Mm -hmm. OK, very good. All right, let's move on to the next one. In our next scenario, we are building a Leadership 101 curriculum for first-time managers. So you've got to develop a learning plan and deliverables to help employees who are going from a technical role to being a leader for the first time. So you've got topics you've been told you're going to develop, building teams, motivating your team, engaging your team, and goal-focused leadership. So once again, what would your go-to resources be in each of these categories? OK, so we're seeing a lot of classrooms, some e-learning. And I want to see your whys before I start giving you a why. I want to see your whys on why you went high on classroom, high on discussion boards, and high on wiki. That's interesting. Um, job shadow is huge. Absolutely. Absolutely. OK, so when we go to the next screen, if everyone's had a chance, um, someone commented on, comment on why you felt that the um, message and discussion boards was important. The network, the community of practice was important. Each one of these, the classroom and the job shadow. I see people changing their mind here. That's interesting, too. Or else you're just adding where you hadn't been on there before. OK. All right. So Justin, if we can pull up the why I chose it, I would like to see some feedback. Um, OK. Oh, great. So we can see this. Oh, no. OK, there it went. OK, so why? someone answer why you felt that classroom was really important for this one. And if someone else wants to answer, why did you feel the message boards would be key? And then OJT, why was why is OJT important for Leadership 101? OK, yes, because they need practice and they need to get feedback. Mm -hmm. The nature of the learning, yes. Need role play in the classroom, yes. It's soft skills, mm -hmm. right? OK, they need the opportunity to role play. Uh, yeah, old method for OK, need, yeah. OK, so you guys are pretty much saying the same thing. They need environments where they can be have at least one mentor around them, or have chances for peer review feedback so that they're figuring out how to do it um, before they have to do it. That's good. OK, very good, very good. All right, um, well, let's move on. Those were great answers and great input. And I hope it gave you a chance to think in terms of big design. So if we can just move on um, back to the presentation. Thank you. OK, so learning is getting easier, really. When we look at that last, the social and the informal learning, it's getting easier for us because the gap between the learner and what's being learned is getting smaller. We don't have to fill that gap. And people are becoming more adept at exploratory knowledge acquisition. They know how to use Siri, and they know how to do Google searches. And information is everywhere. When we go back to that word curation, we just have to be putting it in the right places. 
Um, but we, we, formal learning has not gone away. When we think about Bloom's taxonomy and being at the top of it, these things right here that we're looking at on this screen, this is really, for the most part, finding knowledge. It's not applying knowledge. It's not evaluating what we've learned. And for us as instructional designers, we still have a very large and continuing role in the upper parts of Bloom's, tax Bloom's taxonomy where people need to um, use their higher order thinking skills. So if we don't, I don't see any more Q&A. Feel free to add it over here. But while you're doing that, I'm going to turn it back over to Justin so he can uh, finish us out. And again, thank you so much for your participation today. So Teresa, we actually did have a couple QA questions. Um, I'm not sure okay, if you great. can see them. I'll just read them to you. I don't. Um, okay. Let's see. Uh, were any of the uh, mentoring materials accessible via mobile phones? I think from an example you were using before um, related to mentoring materials. Uh, I was wondering if any of those were available. Okay. okay, mentoring examples available from a mobile phone, like mobile learning for mentors. That would probably be mostly in the form of articles they would access on the go is what I'm thinking right now as opposed to any type of interactive learning since that's mostly a, a soft skill. You know, if they wanted to access their performance guides, if they wanted to access their learner dashboard, they could probably do it from a mobile device. But the interactive exchanges wouldn't be as dynamic, like if you're doing a desk share or something with someone, it wouldn't be as effective. Okay. Okay. And the other question was, um, was uh, says, with some of the techniques, do you think that we are sacrificing quality and effectiveness for easy solutions? I thought that was a good one. Mm -hmm. um, it is very possible. I, I think that I have. I I do believe that our learner, our learners, are intelligently using the technology that is out there, and that we should try to focus on, as I said earlier, I didn't show it today, but the upper end of Bloom's taxonomy in our efforts. And let learners do what they already do well. Let them continue doing it. I think the new skill on the scene is curation for us. And that is finding what learners need to know and putting it in front of them in a usable format. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you very much, Teresa. Thanks for that. That was great. Um, so I will uh, go ahead and move us into the last couple slides and then our feedback um, slides. So thanks for uh, sticking with us here. Just one moment while we load up. Okay. Um, just reiterating who we are, um, Harrisburg University of Science and Technology. Uh, we have a Learning Technologies Master of Science program. You can check us out through those links there. Uh, and then thanks again to Training Pros. We uh, highly value the partnership that we have with them and, and the ability to um, to work with them and host these these webinars. And we, we get a lot out of them, and I hope that everyone else does as well. So just um, going back over uh, the nature of that partnership. So at this point, I'm going to bring up the feedback slides. Um, thanks for sticking around. Uh, just let us know, you know some feedback about the webinar, the quality, some of the items there. And um, we do take the feedback seriously. We use it to improve uh, future offerings. So thank you very much for sticking around. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you.